Welcome. Uh, this is a, uh, an overwhelming crowd. Um, I have to repeat the fire marshal's warning that you're not allowed to sit in the seats. I'm sorry, you can sit in the seats. <laughs> you're not allowed to sit on the stairs or stand in the back. There is some overflow outside in the courtyard, although I understand that it also is quite full. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first Lou Douglas lecture of the year, which is co-sponsored with the Donald Adamchek Distinguished Lecture Series in Sociology. I'm Linda Teener. I'm the Executive Director at UFM Community Learning Center. We're very pleased that this lecture has been included as part of Community Cultural Harmony Week, and I encourage you all to check out the other activities that are going on during the course of this week. I'd like to thank the Dow Multicultural Resource Center, the many KSU departments, community sponsors, and individual donors who make this series possible. The Lou Douglas Lecture Series is named after the distinguished professor of political science, Lou Douglas, who served at Kansas State University from 1949 to 1977. He was widely known for his power to inspire students, faculty, and citizens to instigate change. He was also an influential member of the UFM Board of Directors until his death in 1979, at which time UFM created the lecture series in his honor. With humor, principle, and wisdom, Lou Douglas motivated grassroots organizations and individuals to pursue social justice in politics, economics, and foreign policy. His concern was always for the disenfranchised, the excluded, and the poor. Thus, he focused on civil rights, racial and economic justice, and international peace as his focus. He was respected for his scholarship, scholarly analyses, but he was also loved, often by those that might be considered to be his opponents and those that disagreed with him, for the graciousness and the camaraderie which he showed to all friend and political foe. He represented the highest standards of public morality and elicited our best impulses as citizens to strengthen democracy. It's in this spirit that the Lou Douglas Lecture Series strives to bring provocative speakers who stimulate discussion and promote original thinking and questioning on perspectives of critical public issues. Tonight, we share that charge with the Adam Check Lecture Series as well. Before I introduce um, the, the next speaker in our series, I'd like you to uh, be aware that there will be a question and answer period following the lecture. Uh, we'll take a, br a brief pause for those of you who might need to leave, but I would encourage you all to stay and listen to the questions and answers because that's often a very interesting and insightful part of our lecture series. If you were not able to get a program and you need to have one for class documentation, we did. <laughs> we, you can print the program from our website. Um, you laugh, you laugh. But there are students who are out there clamoring for these programs. Uh, if you'll go to tryufm.org, Click on Lou Douglas Lectures and then the lecture schedule. You can print the program so that you'll have it. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Betsy Cobble, Chair of the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Anthropology, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. You know, I'm thinking there might be a black market in those programs. What do you think? Anyway, before I introduce our speaker for this evening, I want to take a minute to share with you the origins of the Donald J. Adamchek Distinguished Lecture Series in Sociology. I also want to say that it's been one wonderful to have the opportunity to partner with Lou Douglas so we could bring Dr. Frank here, and we appreciate the relationship we've been able to establish. The lecture series, the Adam Check Lecture Series, was established by Social Expressions, which is the Sociology Graduate Student Association, and by current and former faculty colleagues of the late Professor Donald Adamchek to honor his memory. 
by adding intellectual distinction to life at Kansas State University through bringing outstanding speakers here. Dr. Adamchek spent 22 years at Kansas State. During that time, he established himself as a productive scholar who published pro prolifically on a wide range of topics related to his interest in demography, Africa, and development studies. He had an international reputation and received many awards and fellowships, including a Rockefeller Foundation Research Fellowship and a Fulbright as a visiting professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Namibia. Nam I can never say this, Namibia. In February 2000, less than a month before his death from cancer, Adam taught a course on social gerontology in Malta which was sponsored by the United, States, United Nations International Institute on Aging. Adam was a gifted and dedicated teacher and mentor who prepared scores of sociology graduate students, many of them international, for careers in research and teaching and social demography. He was ever alert to opportunities that would help students' careers, whether or not he was on students' committees. His concern for and commitment to his students was all-consuming. In the last week of his life, he was still reading theses and coaching students for job interviews. Is it any wonder that the graduate students were committed to finding a way to honor Dr. Adam Chek? I'm sure he's up there looking down today and smiling that wry smile, knowing that we have brought Dr. Frank here tonight. He would love the controversial debate. But before I introduce Dr. Frank, there's one other individual who the Lou Douglas Lecture and uh, the Adam Check Lecture Committee would like to acknowledge, and that's Dr. Layla Dushkin. She's Professor Emeritus of Sociology, was instrumental in establishing the Adam Check Lecture Series and bringing Dr. Frank here tonight. Indeed, it was her idea. Her persistence has kept us on track and, resulting, and it resulted in the wonderful program we're gonna have this evening. So please join me in thanking Dr. Dushkin. Now to Dr. Frank, you'll have the opportunity to correct anything I may say that's not right. <laughs> Dr. Frank is a native Kansan, sort of. He was born in Kansas City, Missouri, but I think we can claim him. He grew up in Mission Hills, Kansas, and graduated from Shawnee Mission East High School. He was already causing some controversy by the time he was in high school. As one of the editors of the school's underground newspaper, The Estonian, that's not right, you weren't a co-editor? It didn't exist. This is, this is the Wikipedia problem. <laughs> Do you believe it? Okay, we'll skip that. Well, did you attend the University of Kansas? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm so relieved. <laughs> University of Virginia? Yes. Oh, I'm relieved. At the University of Virginia in 1988, he co-founded The Baffler. Is that wrong? a journal of cultural criticism. He received a PhD in history from the University of Chicago in 1994 with his dissertation. You know, there aren't many dissertations you really want to go read, but I got to tell you, The Conquest of Cool, Business Culture, Counterculture, and the Rise of Hip Consumerism. What do you think? This became a national bestseller in 1997. He's also been a contributing writer to the Washington Post, The Nation, In These Times, and other periodicals. In 2000, Dr. Frank published One Market Under God, Extreme Capitalism, Market Populism, and the End of Economic Democracy. This is the study of the mythology of the new economy and the corporate populism of the 90s. Dr. Frank was called by the Los Angeles Times as one of our most insightful social observers. He is the author of the best-selling 2004 book, What's the Matter with Kansas? How Conservatives Won the Hearts of America. Just in case no one knows that, who's here tonight. <laughs> Phil, he, it is filled with his acclaimed wit and acuity. The book asks urgent and provocative questions. You don't think that's right either? I hear him laughing back here. <laughs> I, I just recognize some of the audience. <laughs> 
and how a place famous for its radicalism, remember Bleeding Kansas, became one of the most conservative states in the nation. Dr. Frank, we appreciate your willingness to return to Kansas and share your observations with us. You know, often holding up the mirror is an act of courage. Please join me in welcoming Thomas Frank. Well, thank you. And it's, it's awfully nice of you all to come out here. Um, I, the Wikipedia biography is it's pretty comical. And, um, and I, I, I haven't, you know, fixed it deliberately because uh, I, I just wanted to get more and more crazier and talk about my exploits on Guadalcanal and <laughs> that sort of thing. All right. <laughs> now, I said, well, so I'm, I'm going to K-State, so I'm going to give kind of a... I'm sorry, it's going to be a very boring lecture, and I apologize in advance. And in fact, I'm going to give you the most boring part of it right at the start, okay? I'm really sorry. I'm just, that's who I am. I'm, at the end of the day, I'm a really boring person. <laughs> um, all right. The inescapable, in my opinion, economic fact of our time is the return of inequality in America. I mean, it's so inescapable that even the administration in Washington is now talking about it. Uh, if you go back to... <laughs> I'm sorry, that wasn't, that wasn't fair, was it? I apologize. But if you go back to uh, 1980, when the great conservative revolution in America was just getting off the ground, you'll find that over 20% of the private sector workforce in America belonged to a labor union and that American CEOs uh, back then were paid about, uh, on average, 42 times what their uh, line workers received. And that was a number that was pretty comparable to the numbers that were then coming out of Western Europe and Japan. Today, I read this in the newspaper just the other day, today CEOs receive 400 times as much as their average line workers, while unions have now fallen to 8% uh, of the private sector workforce and are still dropping. Now, however you measure this, it has made for a monumental change in the American landscape. Back in 1980, the richest stratum of American life owned 20% of the nation's wealth. By uh, the end of the 1990s, they owned 40%. And the economists have a way of charting this. Let's see if I can get it up here. Ah, there we have the, the wage thing. Um, the economists have a way of charting this. They call it the Gini Index. Um, and if you look at the historical Gini Index, you see that we are, oh, this is, uh, this is uh, the share of the uh, top uh, percentage, the top upper stratum, uh, their ownership of wealth. You see we're on our way back to the 1920s, if not um, the 19th century. So another way of, of looking at this, this is a, a, another way of, yeah, isn't that great? And see, we're leaving France and the UK behind. Excellent. Yet another way that we're whipping their arse. Uh, and that, <laughs> sorry. And I know they want to broadcast this, so I'm going to try to keep it clean from now on, okay? Anyhow, um, another way of thinking about this, uh, in the period from 1989 to 1999, the median family income in America stayed roughly the same. It didn't grow. But in order to earn that median family income at the very end of the, of the 1990s, your median family had to work six weeks longer a year. Right? Not six hours, not six days, six weeks longer. And while all of this is going on, as, as everybody knows, the uh, cost of medicine and education are spiraling out of control, as they still are. Now, the cause of this enormous shift, I think, has been the, this rejuvenated conservatism since 1980. This sweeping reconfiguration of the economic order with tax cuts, deregulation, privatization, and deunionization. Now, we're, uh, you know, we're accustomed here in America to hearing that we live in such amazingly prosperous times that you know, they can't even be understood by traditional economic standards. But what has changed the most, I think, um, over the years has, has not been uh, productivity so much as it's been distribution of wealth, the way that different actors in society are rewarded for their economic efforts. Productivity goes up and up and up and up and up in America, but wages don't grow at all or grow very, very little. Now, this has not been an engineering triumph 
in my opinion, it has been a political triumph. The traditional enemies of the business class have simply been beaten. That's what's happened. That's what explains all this. But if that's right, if that's true, if that's all what's going on, then how does conservatism continue to win elections and work its will? Right? That's the question. That's what the historians want to know. How does, in particular, how does conservatism happen to do so very well in places where people have been hard hit by the new economic order? For example, look at a place like West Virginia, which at the time of the 2004 election was the poorest state in the country measured by per capita income, and yet it has, just in the last few election cycles, has become Republican. This was a state that was, that was you know, rock rib Democrat. This was, they even went for Michael Dukakis. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's how Democratic they were there. But now it's, now it, it went for Bush, and by, by a substantial margin. I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't even really contested. Now, so while the triumph of conservatism has caused this new uh, inequality that we see in America, it has also, I want to argue, profited from this new inequality. Now, the way in which conservatism addresses us, the way in which it speaks to us as citizens, I think, is very well suited to an unfair age. For example, the conservatism as we see it before us today, it's not social Darwinist, you know, reveling in the destruction of the weak. It's not uh, romantic, right, in the manner of you know, Friedrich Wilhelm IV or something like that, pining for the lost era of feudalism, right? Or like Franco in Spain or something like that. It doesn't, conservatism doesn't insist on the divine right of money like John D. Rockefeller used to do. And it doesn't demand that the lowly learn their place in the great chain of being. What it does instead, it doesn't do any of those things. What it does is it hijacks the language of the angry seeker of justice. It presents itself as a revolt against false authority. It is populist, okay? That's the, that's the key word tonight, populist. So write that down. Now, so that's the subject. We live in a populist age with everybody waving the ban you know, their, his banner proudly for the little guy, the average American, you know, in his war with the elite. But the political choices that we make under the leadership of these new populists are precisely the opposite political choices that you know old time populism used to make, the thing that we used to know so well here in Kansas. We're doing exactly the opposite, but using the same language. The populism that we embrace today only makes these problems that I'm talking about worse. Now, uh, speaking in the most general terms, there are two main branches to present day American conservatism. On the one hand, your familiar culture war variety that we know so well here in Kansas. And then on the other hand, the economic variety, you know, the free market libertarian stuff that you, when you read the Wall Street Journal, that's what you're reading. Or when you live in a place like Washington, D.C., that's what you encounter every day. And that's where I live now, so I know that to be true. <laughs> Anyhow, the two species of, <laughs> sorry, the, the two species of conservatism appeal to different, different groups, and they are, you know, by and large, expounded by different sets of people. They don't, they don't really meet, they don't really overlap, except for in a few uh, important individuals. But one thing that they do have that both of these strains of conservatism has in common is that they are both populist. Both of them claim to speak for the little guy in his war against the high and the mighty. Uh, both of them are anti-elitist, and for both of them, this war against the elites always boils down to the same thing, which is anti-intellectualism. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So write that down, anti-intellectualism. <laughs> Intellectuals, the number one enemy of our new style populism. Now let's take the uh, economic species of conservatism first. Uh, the kind of conservatism whose primary tenet is the near divinity of the free market. Now the centerpiece of this uh, ideology is a belief in the oneness of markets and democracy. That the two things are just, not, they're one and the same. Now I call this um, market populism. And the idea here being that, uh, the, that a market, in addition to being a medium of exchange, is a medium of consent. And this was very much the, uh, the, I, the great idea of the 1990s with you know, commentators all across the political spectrum agreeing that all alternatives to the free market system were now uh, permanently discredited. 
So with the market's mechanisms of supply and demand, poll and focus group, superstore and internet, markets were thought to express the popular will more articulately and more meaningfully than mere elections. Uh, by their very nature, markets were supposed to confer democratic legitimacy. Markets were supposed to bring down the pompous and the snooty. Markets were supposed to look out for the interests of the little guy. Markets were supposed to give us what we want, right? Indeed, markets were supposed to be a form of revolution. Remember this? Fast Company magazine. So thanks to, um, I love this, this stuff, the fists. <laughs> oh, such rubbish. <laughs> and I'll never let them forget it. <laughs> so thanks to markets, little old ladies were supposed to be trading stocks online and whipping the Wall Street pros. And thanks to markets, workers were supposed to be getting rid of contracts and becoming free agents, right? executive freedom fighter. Thanks to markets, the internet was allowing each and every one of us to be ourselves, you know, to rebel against tradition. Yeah. <laughs> Remember those days? This is the best one. Check this out. What's it, Ken Lay? <laughs> A corporate revolutionary? Right next to him, Dennis Kozlowski? He's now like doing time somewhere. <laughs> All right, now, <laughs> as, uh, so markets are revolutions. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not going to laugh. As, as, as we here in Kansas know, of course, populism, what populism used to be, 100 years ago when people used the term with a capital P, right, populism, what they meant by it was a rebellion against the corporate order. And the corporate order hated populism. They used to call it anarchy and repudiation. This is a, a picture of, that was the governor of Illinois, John Peter Altgeld, holding William Jennings Bryan up in front of his face to mask his real aims, which are anarchy and repudiation. <laughs> um, I got some others. There's a, on, that's Altgeld again with Debs off to his left, and you see on the far right those chin whiskers. You see that? That's our own Kansas Senator, William Peffer. <laughs> oh, sorry, not the laugh. <laughs> Anyhow, this is how, this is how uh, conservatives viewed populism 100 years ago. It was insane. There's William Jennings Bryan, buffoon. But anyhow, market populism, you know, what we have now sees things a little bit differently, of course. <laughs> now it's the capitalists who are the uh, rebels. I love this one. Do we have any e economic students here? <laughs> So forget about the boss, right? Forget about the robber barons. Forget about economic royalists. The real class enemy in the 1990s is intellectuals who are always supposed to stand at the very top loftiest point of the American social hierarchy. Now, in the 90s, the businessman's age-old suspicion of the meddling highbrow, in addition to just being repeated everywhere across the culture, also became... Um, a kind of a practical everyday thing, something like a rule of the universe, just a reflection of the new economic you know, era that we had entered. And you would hear this all the time. You'll remember this phrase. Things had changed so dramatically that the experts didn't understand anymore. The experts couldn't measure the dynamic uh, progress of the late 1990s. They couldn't figure out how to value the internet stocks, which actually turned out to be a pretty wise thing to not try. They, they couldn't... <laughs> The experts couldn't understand the uh, importance of brands. They couldn't figure out the, the non-linear, non-rational, new style corporation. And they sure as hell could not adjust things using their traditional tools. So the idea is that the world was moving according to new rules and intellectuals just didn't get it. Okay? Now there are some kinds of intellectuals, there are some exceptions to this rule. Um, this was also the golden age of the computer programmer and the brand builder. Uh, you know, the advertising man, the creative accountant, uh, which ended all very badly, of course. And <laughs> it turns out you don't want a creative accountant <laughs> at the end of the day. But, <laughs> but business leaders in the 1990s loved to compare themselves to these, you know, unpredictable geniuses like the Impressionists and the great jazz musicians. And they developed this taste for Frank Gehry architecture. This is the business school at, uh, one, uh, in Cleveland at the Case Western or something. I forget where it is. Frank Gehry designed it. I love that place, Cleveland. I mean, not that building, but anyhow. <laughs> but 
even while they were going, getting into that stuff, for things like the social sciences and for the broader idea that human intelligence could actively remake the social world, your new economy thinkers had only contempt. Okay, so I'm going to run through a couple of the big thinkers of the new economy. And for those of you who don't remember the 90s or who are only like 10 years old or whatever when it happened, it'll be really exciting, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so, so let's start with Walter Riston, who was the CEO of, of uh, Citibank. He actually uh, passed, passed on just a few months ago. But he was the CEO of Citibank in the 80s. And then in 1992, he published this book called The Twilight of Sovereignty, in which he celebrated the worldwide triumph of the corporation as a triumph for the humble people, the little people. Uh, new technology, and I'm not exaggerating, you can, you can check it out of the library and read it yourself. New technology, he said, had changed everything. This was his term. It had changed everything. It had launched an information revolution in which all efforts to regulate industry were now as outmoded as the sundial. In, particularly, in particular, Riston was really into the idea that, that uh, measurement, economic measurement was futile. Uh, government economists, he wrote, who used to be pretty sure what made, what made economies work can no longer even measure what is going on in the world. And of course, you cannot fine tune what you cannot measure. So this horror of economic measurement was one of the sort of, uh, it was a recurring theme in the new economy literature. It comes up again, in fact, I saw a reference to it just the other day in the Wall Street Journal when one of the colonial, last colonial governors of Hong Kong died and they had an obituary for him and they said, how did he turn Hong Kong into this great success story? By not allowing uh, economists to uh, measure the economy. That's how he did it. That was his stroke of genius. Why do they hate measurement? My theory is that it's because econometrics and all the other uh, modern tools for measuring economic activity had basically been introduced in the U.S. in the 30s as part of the New Deal. You know, you know what that is, right? Yes, of course you do. And you know that the business community hated the New Deal and has fought it tooth and claw ever since the 1930s. Um, so measurement in their minds was related by birth to regulation to high taxes and to the rise of organized labor. But in the information revolution, the great banker Walter Riston maintained all of this high-flying hubris would have to end. Governments would have to learn humility before the eternal principles of the market. They would have to learn modesty. They would have to know that they do not know. It's like something you could say in church, right? You're talking about like the almighty there. So the intellectuals are always fools according to new economy thinking. And among other uh, examples, um, I'll just give you one. Newt Gingrich thinks that intellectuals are responsible for causing the business cycle, you know, which would not exist in his mind if government economists didn't always try to regulate things, try to you know, solve the business cycle. Therefore, they end up causing it, and they're to blame for the whole thing. So the intellectuals are fools, but the common people are brilliant people indeed. So even though the experts can't measure things anymore, individuals remain fully rational economic actors, totally capable of making our every little need known in the marketplace and of looking out for our interests. So we are perfectly fine as uh, you know, self-interested economic actors. Just don't let us go out there and get sociology PhDs or something like that and try figuring out the big picture. That is absolutely off the table. Similarly, we, you know, we, they, they love that phrase, they, I'm sorry, the uh, economic conservatives love the phrase um, uh, uh, free to choose, just as long as you don't choose to be in a labor union right? <laughs> or, or vote for one of them liberals or something like that, right? Now, you find this attitude all across the 90s, even in like practical best-selling investment books uh, where anti-intellectualism, this hatred of intellectuals, comes together with Wall Street's traditional desire to bring in investors and cast itself as a, this great friend of middle America. For example, you all remember who Peter Lynch was? He was like the, the, I don't know, the best stock picker of all time or something like this, ran a very, a, the biggest mutual fund uh, for Fidelity or something like that. He's still, he's still around. You see, his, his, uh, you see him every now and then. Uh, but he wrote this series of best-selling investment books in the 1990s, and he became famous for his personal averageness. So instead of having gone to Harvard, he went to Boston College. He brags about how he spends his spare time at the shopping mall you know, he doesn't go to Studio 54 and get high or whatever it is. And, and his, uh, Peter Lynch's investing strategy is also relentlessly populist. 
and anti-intellectual. Back in the 60s, if you all read your Wall Street history, back in the 1960s here, Wall Street superstars used to always say that the, the way you would uh, make a profit was to figure out what the public was doing and then do exactly the opposite, right? Showing their great contempt for, uh, for the common man. But Peter Lynch did exactly the opposite, or he said exactly the opposite. He said, stop listening to professionals. Any normal person can pick stocks just as well, if not better, than the average Wall Street expert. So instead of some you know, complex system for uh, picking stocks, Lynch proposed what he, he called the, the power of common knowledge, in which it is your averageness that determines your success as, in the stock market. And this was the great motif of the decade's investment literature, the common man triumphant over the Wall Street professional, the bankruptcy of expertise, the foolishness of the experts. Consider, uh, for example, the saga of the Beardstown ladies. Y'all remember these people, these small town grandmas from downstate Illinois who became the object of this media storm in the early 1990s when their investment club racked up some fantastic number. You see it down there at the bottom. It later turned out to not be true. It turns out they weren't very good at math. But that's, that's not where I'm going tonight. <laughs> now, <laughs> the, the point of this episode was not, was not that the Beardstown ladies had really good investment advice. They didn't. If you read this book, it's mainly about like how to read the stock listings in the newspaper, and then they have a lot of recipes for muffins and stuff like that scattered <laughs> in between. The, the point of this, of the, the media storm about the Beardstown ladies, was this moral fable, this idea that even society's lowliest, feeblest, and worst informed people, right, these small town grannies from the, from the, uh, from the small town Midwest, that these people could beat what they called the self-important MBAs of New York, Zurich, or Tokyo. This, they could beat them if they had done their math, but it turns out. But there's a, there's a, there's a hundred examples of this. Like, consider the motley fool. Or, you know, they run these columns in newspapers all across the country where the idea is the fools are triumphant over the experts. Or uh, the millionaire next door. Or my favorite of them all, James Glassman's 1999 bestseller, Dow 36,000. Yeah, just think about that one for a minute. The idea here, and I actually read this book. I think I'm one of the only people who did. The, the, idea, the idea of this book was that the, the stock market in 1999 should rightfully have been standing at 36,000, not at 10,000. And the reason for this, the reason why the stock market should be going so, so high was that the people were getting smarter and smarter, more and more rational, realizing that they should trust the market and driving prices high as a result. So high stock prices, uh, Glassman said, reflected not the people's nuttiness, but their sanity. So thus, in the fluctuations of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, this author claimed he could see a sort of class war in miniature, with small investors in their glorious wisdom being what he called rationally exuberant, while the hated experts were always trying to slow their drive to the top by accusing the little people of being screwy. So every trade you made was thus a vote on what you thought of the common man. Now, I don't need to tell you how badly this ended. Um, anyhow, oh, wait, you're not supposed to see that one yet. <laughs> so, but the political implications of it. The political implications of this it should be obvious. If it is an act of elitism to believe that society can be organized in any way other than the free market way, if what the market does is the will of the people, then any scheme to operate outside of the market's auspices or to control its ravages is by definition the hubris of false expertise. Don't think about how to fix things, the market populists tell us. Surrender your arrogant egotism and humbly heed what the market whispers. So this is the politics of it, and you see it playing out right now in the debate over Walmart, um, which I saw an editorial on in the newspaper just the other day, and so I thought I'd talk about that. Walmart, right, the largest retailer of all time. And liberals these days are saying that Walmart is using monopoly power to cannibalize its suppliers, drive down wages, and destroy small towns. And conservatives counter by saying, you're a snob, right? <laughs> they bring the argument instantly back to the populism. You just don't like, the, the, thing, the problem with, with you liberals is you just don't like the kind of people who shop at Walmart. And besides, we the people love Walmart. We approve of every business decision Walmart's management has made. How do we know that we love Walmart? Because we shop there. 
right? And thus we vote for the Walmart way. Markets are democracies. Now, democracy itself, though, if it allows liberals to get in and you know, break Walmart up or something like that, democracy itself is tyranny. It's a, you know, a forum in which sushi-eating intellectuals and Volvo drivers can threaten to derail Walmart's business plan and tell the rest of us how to live. Markets are democracy, right? <laughs> okay, now, none of this ever struck me as a particularly convincing <laughs> doctrine. You know, there are some people who buy it. The Wall Street Journal op-ed page, now that silly picture. Uh, and there's, you know, new, York, new style liberals like Thomas Friedman. Those kind of people buy it. But it has very little resonance among average people, especially in the aftermath of things like Enron and WorldCom, uh, when you saw the insiders just fleecing the little people yet again. And besides, how many people really believe that a corporation is holy or that outsourcing is just, you know, a step in the process to self-actualization. I mean, <laughs> it's preposterous. But culture war populism, now we're going to switch to the other form of conservatism. Culture war populism is different. Now, this is something that intellectuals brush off. Now, they don't like to talk about it. They don't like to think about it. And they refuse to take it seriously. But the culture wars have enormous appeal at the grassroots. Again, something that we know very well here in Kansas. And I think the reason that the culture wars are so popular is that they do something that other forms of conservatism don't. They talk about class. And this is the key. I think at the center of culture war populism is a way of thinking about class that both encourages class hostility and that at the same time denies the economic basis of the grievance. So class conservatives will tell you, or this kind of conservative, this sort of uh, social conservative will tell you, class isn't really about money or birth or occupation. What it is, is it is primarily a matter of authenticity, this sort of cultural commodity. By the way, this is, according to, to this kind of conservative, this is a map of the American class system. So you see, and there's the snobbish regions where I live, and there's the, the, the humble and, and virtuous regions where we are today. So class, and you can tell what a snob I am by my tie, class is about, <laughs> is about what kind of car you drive, and where you shop, and how you pray, and only secondarily about the job that you do or the income that you make. So what makes you a member of the noble proletariat, according to this way of looking at things, isn't work per se, but you know these moral qualities, unpretentiousness, humility, and all the rest of the uh, red state virtues that our pundit corps never tires of celebrating. So incidentally, these are the uh, same virtues that back in the 1990s they told us made you a particularly good day trader, <laughs> ironically. And also this populism, just to mention this, has the same enemies as the other one, which is namely France. <laughs> Right? The socialist snob state of France. <laughs> so, according to this way of looking at the world, the producer class doesn't care about unemployment or a dead end life or a boss that makes 400 times as much as they do. No, none of that stuff matters. Out in the red states, both workers and their bosses are supposed to be united in righteous disgust at those affected college boys sitting over at the next table, you know, prattling on about French cheese and villas in Tuscany and the big ideas for running things that they read about in books, right? <laughs> These are the real parasites nowadays. It's not Enron. It's not Merrill Lynch. It's me. That's who it is. <clears throat> now... <laughs> Later, we'll talk about where I got that sticker. The, the, the key element in this repackaging of class, see, there's two classes in America. There's Americans and there's liberals. This, the, the key element in this repackaging of class is the idea of a liberal elite. And this is an idea that goes way, way back. But in its basic outlines, it has always remained pretty much the same. And it goes like this. Our culture and our schools and our government the culture warriors say, all of these are controlled by an overeducated ruling class that is contemptuous of the beliefs and practices of regular people. So those who run America, the theory holds, are these sort of despicable, self-important show-offs. They are effete 
to use one of Spiro Agnew's favorite words. They are arrogant. They are snobs. They are liberals. So, I'm sorry, I couldn't get a bigger picture of that when I lost my copy. From the mild-mannered David Brooks to the ever-wrathful Ann Coulter, attacks on the personal tastes and pretensions of this stratum of society are basically, that's the stock in trade of, cons of culture war writers. Now they, the conservatives, are the real outsiders, they tell us, gazing with disgust upon the ludicrous manners of the high and the mighty. Or they tell us they're you know, rough and ready proles, laughing along with us at the efforts of our social betters to reform and improve us. So the conservatives cast their acid gaze on you know, college towns in New England where self-righteous young students flirt intensely with some species of lifestyle experimentation, party away the nights, and consume their special, special lattes. <laughs> Can you get those here, by the way? <laughs> <clears throat> the conservatives laugh derisively at the earnest young vegans of Washington, D.C., two years out of brown and already lording over the hardworking people of the interior from a desk at the EPA. Now, conservatism, on the other hand, is supposed to be the doctrine of the oppressed majority. Unlike your classical 19th century style, you know, Edmund Burke conservatism, uh, the, the culture wars that I'm talking about, they don't defend some established order of things. What they do is they accuse, they rant, they point out hypocrisies and gleefully pounce on contradictions. And while liberals are always supposed to be using their you remember this guy? Liberals are always supposed to be using their control of the airwaves and the newspapers and the schools to persecute average people. The Republicans tell us that they are the true party of the disrespected, the downtrodden, the forgotten. They are always the underdog, always in rebellion against a haughty establishment, always rising up from below. It's an ad for Richard Vigory's book. He, he had already, this is 83, he'd already given up on Reagan. He was like, ah, oh, the Republicans have sold out. We need a new conservative party. Not conservative enough. Um, by the way, he's doing that again now with Bush. Exactly the same thing. It's very interesting. Anyhow, so all claims on the right, on the culture war right, in other words, advance today from victimhood. And this is important to remember. This is why uh, culture war conservatives revel in these fantasies of their own marginality and persecution. And I use that word deliberately because that's the t actually the title of a book by Rush Limbaugh's brother Dave. Or another example, think of the famous, uh, my favorite, The War on Christmas, in which the uh, world's <laughs> humble <laughs> hundreds of millions of Christians are said to be trod upon by a handful of oversensitive intellectuals. Or the, the, the very best of all, The War on Meat, a new one which I only heard about a few weeks ago, which is even more purely a fantasy. I, if the liberals declare war on meat, I'm going to have to become a Republican myself. <laughs> now... <laughs> As with the, the market populism that I described earlier, the sort of free market uh, uh, conservatism, culture war populism is deeply concerned with the rationality of the public, in theory anyways, with the rationality of the public and how this is always supposed to be constantly underestimated by liberal intellectuals. And if you spend a lot of time on their listservs and read their magazines, and I don't suggest you do this, it's, <laughs> you'll, you'll find missives where conservatives greet each other with phrases like, um, fellow rubes of the flyover, right? Because libs are always supposed to be looking down on them as they go back and forth from LA to DC. Uh, and th this is, there's a, the American Enterprise Magazine was running a whole series of articles right after uh, Bush got elected the first time about the virtues of people in the red states. And here's how one of them started. I'm stupid. And if you're <laughs> reading this, you probably are too. The comical thing about that is that the American Enterprise Institute, of course, is the brilliant think tank that dreamed up the war in Iraq. <laughs> Same bunch of people, you know. Uh, <laughs> Laura Ingram wrote a book about elites a few years ago, and this is, how they this is how her publisher described it. Meet the elites. They think you're stupid. They think all freedom-loving Americans are stupid. They think patriotism is stupid. They think church-going is stupid. They think flag-flying is stupid. They despise families with more than two children. They're sure that where we live, you know, anywhere but, but near or in a few major cities, is an insipid cultural wasteland. Now, the implication of this conservative uh, culture of offense-taking is that liberalism 
can be held responsible for the world around us. That each of these petty objections that you'll find in the movement literature, these petty objections to the way people drive, the way people cut in line, the way people talk with their mouths full, that each of these is somehow an indictment of the left. And, it, and I'm not exaggerating here. And it doesn't matter that liberals have long since lost their power over government. I mean, and check it out. I was born in 1965. There hasn't been a proper liberal elected president of this country since before I was born. But that doesn't matter. In the culture war mind, liberalism is still what, uh, what changes our mores, what determines what goes on TV and into the magazines and what makes, or I should say, interprets the laws. And there is nothing, not the Constitution, not guns, not even sweeping electoral victories. There is nothing that can protect us from liberalism or even slow it down. It is an alien, conspiratorial force that can't be held accountable and that doesn't care when its projects go awry. Now, this is why conservatism, in my opinion anyway, why conservatives tend to choose cultural battles where victory is impossible, where their followers' feelings of powerlessness are just ramped up and their alienation dramatized. For example, while I was writing What's the Matter with Kansas, the big backlash fury object du jour was the Alabama Ten Commandments monument. You all remember that. They put up that monument and they knew uh, they did it deliberately to draw a lawsuit from the ACLU and everybody knew that how that chapter was going to end with that monument being pried loose and carted away. But then, of course, the bizarre second act as the monument was dragged around the country on the back of a truck <laughs> so that the so that the millions could share in the persecution. Here it is at Mount Rushmore. <laughs> so that we can all feel powerless and, and betrayed. You can just see Washington weeping. <laughs> Little stone tears. Or, I'm sorry, I got off track. Or, the other examples of this, the Federal Marriage Amendment, which Bush campaigned on all through 2004. When he got reelected, the Washington Post did an uh, interview with him, and they asked him, what do you, you know, Federal Marriage Amendment, most important, the family most important thing ever. You've got your you know, political capital. What are you going to do about the Federal Marriage Amendment, which you campaigned on all through the last year? And you know what Bush's answer was? To make a very long and winding answer short, he said, nothing. I'm going to do nothing about it. Or the great abortion controversy, which mobilizes millions of people, which, but which cannot be put to rest without a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. Or my favorite of all, the, uh, of course, the war on evolution, right? How many, how many biologists do you think they're going to persuade? <laughs> I don't have a slide for that, but it's none. <laughs> Look, viewed through the eyes of the backlash, liberalism's impositions are so intolerable and so bizarre and taken with so little regard for the sensibilities of the regulated that it will literally stop at nothing. I mean, who knows what precedent the Supreme Court's going to pull out of its ass next, right? Or what, which figure of, of political speech, or, or I'm sorry, which figure of everyday speech the commissars of political correctness are going to criminalize, even as they enlarge the list of swear words permissible for broadcast on TV, one of which I just uttered a second ago. <laughs> Your conservative movement culture abounds with this kind of bizarre speculation about what atrocity the libs are going to inflict on us tomorrow. Each wild suggestion made and received with complete seriousness. So check it out. The liberal elite is going to outlaw major league sports. Right? They're going to forbid red meat. They're going to mandate special holidays for transgendered war veterans. <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm not making any of these up. Each of these came up as a, as a real cause of concern on a listserv that I was on. People were very worried about this. They were going to hand our neighborhood over to an Indian tribe. They were going to decree that only gay couples can adopt children. They're going to they're ban the Bible. Now this one, it turns out, the Republican Party, I, I thought that was a joke too <laughs> when I first heard about it, and it turns out that the uh, Republican National Committee actually sent out this uh, mailing in Arkansas and West Virginia. And since the election, I've actually heard of people who cast their vote for Bush on this basis, because they didn't want to see the Bible get banned. I mean, who does? 
Now let's remind ourselves before we go on that all of these things are class-based complaints. This is all about class at the end of the day, or it's something like class-based complaints. Um, consider in this connection the uh, remark made by uh, Gary Bauer. You all know, you know who Gary Bauer is. He ran for president in, uh, a few years ago. And the New York Times interviewed him during the 04 campaign, and they asked him, what do I have here? Oh, yeah, that's, isn't that beautiful? I love that. That's just, that is just ingenious advertising. That's, you, it, it just hammers the message home in so many different ways. Anyhow, Gary, Gary Bauer. The, the New York Times asked Gary Bauer of why the culture wars just go on and on and on. Why don't these things ever end? Why does it persist? And Gary Bauer answered, this is what he said. He said, Joe Sixpack doesn't understand why the world and his culture are changing and why he doesn't have a say in it. And when I read that, I was like, my God, that is, it's totally true. I mean, the world is changing and the average guy doesn't have a say in it. It's absolutely correct. But that's the way liberals used to talk. We were the ones that stood up for Joe Sixpack, you know, and for the angry average man looking at this world that he had no control over. And now, it's Gary Bauer. Um, it's Republicans that make that claim and that use that language. So, to believe that liberalism is this all-powerful movement uh, makes for a singular, singularly negative and depressing movement culture on the right. To believe in the new economy, I mean, that's to be like a hallucinatory optimist. But uh, to be a culture war conservative is to be an extreme pessimist. To believe in a world where your side can never win, where you know, your side almost by definition cannot win, where even the most shattering electoral victories turn out to be hollow and the liberal stranglehold on life can never be broken. So conservatives in the, in the culture war, and this is, uh, it's K-State, so I can use, I can use, I can say this here. Conservatives believe that they are without agency, that they are hapless victims, adrift in a fatalistic universe where only liberals have the power to act, and where every act undertaken by those liberals is an imposition on the good people of middle America. Now, sometimes I think, when I'm reading this stuff, that this culture war vision of life is nothing more than a really old-fashioned leftist vision of life, only with the economics drained out of it. Where your you know, muckrakers of 100 years ago, by the way, we had a lot of those guys in Kansas, but where your muckrakers of 100 years ago used to always blame capitalism for screwing up this institution and that, the uh, culture war thinkers simply changed the script to blame liberalism. They're talking about the same stuff, the press, uh, the universities, the art world, you know, government, architecture, law, whatever. They're talking about the same things that the muckrakers talked about a hundred years ago. They've just decided to, you know, cross out capitalism and write in liberalism. You know, it's the same stuff. The high and the mighty are doing this to you. Uh, I'll give you one example. Up until the late 1960s, the sort of classic critique of the press that you heard in America was that uh, American newspapers tilted to the right serving the interests of the capitalists that advertised in them and the capitalists that published them. You know, people like William Randolph Hearst, a sterling liberal. Or, <laughs> or my favorite, uh, Colonel Robert McCormick of Chicago, of whom it was once said that he had the finest mind of the 13th century. <laughs> anyway, he was not a liberal, okay? <laughs> These were very right-wing men. But today, as everybody knows, it's the exact opposite. Is, is the critique. It's supposed to be liberal reporters and liberal editors that twist the news to match their elitist personal preferences. Uh, there's the editors of Time doing it, you see, and toasting it with champagne underneath their chandelier and no doubt on two-inch thick shag carpeting. Um, and they basically the, the movement does the same thing to all your old leftist uh, critiques of you know higher education, the legal world, all of these things. Each of the institutions is now a slavish servant, not of the interests, but of liberalism. Now, even the the rhetoric of the culture wars, you know, with all of its regular guy flourishes. By the way, here's Tip O'Neill getting out of his Cadillac. <clears throat> the, this rhetoric that the culture warriors use is lifted whole cloth from the proletarian 1930s. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is something that I noticed. It's kind of a funny story. There was this <clears throat> kind of 
kind of literature back in the 30s called proletarian fiction. It's real bad stuff, and you can guess what it was all about. And uh, it's a hobby of mine to collect it, because you can get it cheap, and it's old, and you know. So anyhow, I'm reading one of these novels, real terrible stuff, and I'm reading Ann Coulter at the same time. And, <laughs> and it, 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 it hits me, by God, it is the same stuff, you know? You, you just switch the villains very, very slightly, and it's exactly the same stuff. There was a, one of the, the sort of great minds of proletarian literature. This guy called Mike Gold, real honest-to-God communist. He worked for the Daily Worker in New York. And he had a famous beatdown of Thornton Wilder some, at some point in the 30s, his famous fight with Thornton Wilder, the playwright. And he, his accusation against Wilder, the way he made fun of Thornton Wilder, is he was like, Thornton Wilder is devitalized. We would say a feat now. He writes with purple ink. He likes things that are French. Right? <laughs> he likes to hang around in discreet drawing rooms. It's, it's the exact same stereotype now. We, just, we don't say the bourgeoisie like, like they did back then. We say liberals. Right? This is an Art Young cartoon. Art Young was a socialist cartoonist. Uh, and this is a cartoon making fun of the Associated Press, right? Like I was saying, the, the media was supposed to be right-wing back in those days. It's a complicated cartoon, and I'm not even going to try to explain it, but if you, if you covered up those dollar signs and didn't see what all the words, uh, the words said, you, you'd point at this stereotype. If that ran in a newspaper today, you'd say, well, who is that? That is a liberal. Okay, now, I've, now I'm lost. So, uh, aren't we all... <laughs> so where does this leave our conservative friends? When you have rejected all the social science methods for understanding the way things work, and they do, and when you can't talk straight about social class, and they can't, and when you can't acknowledge, when it is forbidden to you to acknowledge that free market forces might not always be for the best, when you can't admit the validity of the most basic historical truths, these blunt tools are all that you're left with. Journalists and sociologists and historians and musicians and photographers and even paleontologists do what they do because they are liberals. And liberals lie. <laughs> liberals cheat. Liberals will do anything, as a matter of fact, that promises to you know, advance their larger partisan project, which is to create more liberals and thus somehow to win. Right? <laughs> So according to this way of looking at it, liberalism is not a product of social forces, you know, the labor movement, the environmental movement, that sort of thing. That's not what liberalism is. It is a social force. It is a juggernaut that moves according to a logic of history all its own, as rigid and as mechanical as anything dreamed up by the Stalinists of the 1930s. Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> And then you can, you know, then we can drink the beer. <laughs> Three two beer. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Now, the the great shift to the right in America started with the coming together of two very different political factions. On the one hand, your traditional business Republicans with their faith in the free market, and then on the other hand, these guys the working class middle Americans, remember, who signed on to preserve family values. Now, for the first group, the sort of Johnson County type Republicans, um, <laughs> what? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> the Johnson County Republicans. The conservative revival that has resulted since the late 60s has been fantastically rewarding. I mean, they are wealthier as a class today than ever before in their lifetimes. And I'm reminded of this every time I go back to Mission Hills and see the teardowns. <laughs> but, uh, but for the other group, for these guys, you know, the hard hats for Nixon, the angry middle Americans, the conservative experience has pretty much been a bummer all around. I mean, all they have to show, I love this picture, all they have to show for their decades now of Republican loyalty are lower wages, more dangerous jobs, dirtier air, a new overlord class that comports itself like King Farouk, and of course a crap culture whose moral freefall continues without any significant interference from the grandstanding Christers that they send triumphantly back to Washington every couple of years. By all rights, they, 
By all rights, I think the charm of republicanism should have worn off for these guys a long time ago. I mean, after all, how can you lament the shabby state of American life while absolving business of any responsibility for it? How can you complain so bitterly about culture and yet neglect to mention the main factor making our culture what it is? How can you reconcile these two clashing halves of the conservative mind? And we see them clash every day here in Kansas. I'll tell you how you can do it. By believing in an all-powerful liberal elite. That's how. Alone among the many, many industries of the world, the conservatives say, well, the culture industry, there they are. They're under your bed. <laughs> So the conservatives say, you know, look, the culture industry, it just doesn't respond to those, you know, pure and good market forces. It does the crazy and ugly things that it does because it is biased by robotic alien liberals trying to drip their corrosive liberalism into our ears. So liberal bias exists because it must exist for the rest of cons contemporary conservatism to make any sense at all as in St. Anselm's proof of the existence of God, which flummoxed generations of our ancestors, it just can't be any other way. Bias has to be, therefore it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Do you think there's a relationship between conservatism, as you describe it, and a declining educational system in this country? Well, well, there there is because the conservatives tend to be, you know, to they want you know want to do away with the Department of Education. They tend to be more hostile to funding of public education. Even here in Kansas, where we have fairly good public schools, there they're always pressing for vouchers. You know what vouchers would do to the public schools, and so do they, and that's why they want to do it. Um, but on the other hand, conservatives, uh, well, then you, then you, I mean, this is a, you know, this is a big battle within the Republican Party, especially here in, here in Kansas, where people who think of themselves, or the kind of people that I grew up with, who think, used to think of themselves as being very conservative people, are very pro-public education back in Johnson County. And they fight and fight and fight over this. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think they really like to have very excellent private schools. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What Thank is you. it? Harvard hates America. It, in, until, you know, they take it over and then... <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I was wondering what you think Democrats can do in the upcoming elections to, uh, to actually create a new strategy that's not actually playing into populism. It seems like sometimes Hillary Clinton is, you know, talking about God and it kind of falls yeah. flat. Um, well, do you the, think they're the, playing the, into it or do the, you think the, the, There's a very stuff? obvious strategy for the Ds and they all know what it is and they don't want to do it. Uh, and the strategy is uh, they have, to, they have to, to return to who they were. They have to rediscover uh, what liberalism is. I mean, the fact is that economic liberalism remains very popular in this country today. National health care, social security. These things are, uh, yeah, getting paid well. You know, it turns out that's really popular. Um, <laughs> the, the economic liberalism is fantastically popular. However... To embrace economic liberalism is uh, like to sign your death warrant as a politician. Your funding goes away the next day. This is because our politics in this country are about money. You know, whether you're a D or an R, and that's how we cynical people in D.C. talk, whether you're a D or an R, you have to go to the same people for fundraising. And that is in every congressional district in America. It's business people and, uh, and, and you know, high net worth individuals, as they say. And those people... You know, they might be uh, liberal on social issues. Many of them are. I mean, you look at a guy like Soros, right? Many of them are. But they aren't on the economic issues. The constituency for the economic issues is, uh, is working people. And they don't have that kind of money. I mean, you have a, some group, some guys here and there that are managed to make... Anyhow, so long story short, embrace that politics. It's A, popular, and B, it, it, it uh, undercuts conservative populism. I mean, it just takes that off the table, makes it look asinine instantly um, and uh, but they don't want to embrace it and we, they probably won't sorry <laughs> yes ma'am uh, about your uh, point late in the presentation about the need to uh, create an enemy uh, a, a, a despised uh, but not really all that po all that powerful enemy. Uh, was I wrong to be reminded of 1930s Germany? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I you know um, I I don't make that claim in the book, um, and you know I, I I I didn't mean to remind you of that, but. Um, you know, it's this is if, if if I reminded you of that, then then I'm I'm you know I apologize. But uh, no, I don't think it's anything like that. But uh, uh, what can I say? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm a Republican, so probably gonna be tarred and feathered in the parking lot after this. But I just wanted to ask my question anyway. Um, I'd like to know how you form these sweeping generalizations about Kansans, considering you're from Kansas City, Mission Hills, no less. And that's one of the most wel more wealthy liberal parts of the state. And I would just like to know how um, you've come up with this, you know, view of conservative Kansas since you're not from rural Kansas. And also, are you actually suggesting that voting for liberals like Ted Kennedy and Hillary Clinton is going to set us free? Well, those two aren't. Uh, uh, you know, Teddy Kennedy is a he's he's a, he's all right. His heart's in the right place, I think. I don't know much about Hillary Clinton. Um, I like the idea of national health care, but I think she went about it all wrong. Uh, I think it would do some things good, but by and large, what I, like what I said earlier, the, the, the other half of this story, which I didn't talk about tonight, is that the Democrats have really dropped the ball. 
And in a lot of ways, they've brought this reaction on themselves. And the way that they've done that is they, they don't serve their traditional working class constituency. And these people, you know, when was the last time a national democratic politician really tried hard to win the farm vote? When? It was Jesse Jackson in 88. Right? And he didn't even get the nomination. Before that, I don't know, you'd have to go back to I don't know, a long ways. It just doesn't happen anymore. They don't even try. They don't even you know, talk about these, what they need to talk about in order to speak to average people in a place like Kansas. And so I think they, they bring this on themselves. And I, think, uh, uh, I don't think Hillary Clinton is all, is all that wonderful. I mean, I like her. She's, she's nice. But uh, I, I don't think she'll change things that much. So that's, that's, the, that's the other half of the question. Now, that shouldn't be where politics ends, that we have a lousy choice from the R's and we have a lousy choice from the D's. You know, our ancestors took matters into their own hands here in this state. And they set up their own party, the populist party. And there were all sorts of issues in the 1890s. In a lot of ways, it's very similar to now. The two parties weren't addressing all sorts of subjects. The, you know, the equality was a thing of the past. You had these concentration of wealth, these great fortunes. You had monopolies. You had a unregulated uh, business climate. And Neither party was addressing it. And people in Kansas and a couple other places, but mainly here, said, by God, you have to talk about these things. And we put issues on the table when the two parties weren't addressing them. And I think we have to do that again. Now, I'm sorry, then the other thing was about... Um, uh, my generalizations about Kansas. And uh, I, I try to... You'd have to look through the book, but there's a lot of different groups in Kansas, groups fighting with each other, uh, and a lot of different types of people, different. And I try to take that into account in the book. And uh, Johnson County is in Kansas, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> There's no, no doubt about it. That's where it is. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, but I could not sit any longer. My name is Nancy Boyda, and I certainly... <laughs> And I have every reason to believe I'm going to be representing this district in Congress. All right. Wait, isn't it? Uh, isn't this Jim, Jim Ryan? Ryan's? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. Where so is let he, me by just the say isn't to the Republican, here? may I, may I offer some something to the Republican? And it was an excellent question. I come from an extremely conservative family. My my background is extremely conservative. Whenever I try to talk to my father about anything, he comes back and says you liberals are going to take the words under God off of our money. And that's what it's all I'm about. Going, Dad, I've <laughs> never said anything about taking the words. We can't have a topic. We can't have a conversation because every one of them comes back to you want it. Dad, stop with it. But he can't. That's what liberal means to him is we're going to take the words under God from off of our money. Nothing can convince him that otherwise, because it is, a valor, it is a very powerful, powerful lesson about what the liberals are going to do to you. The fact is, I think we do have. Let me get back to what I couldn't sit and say anymore. On the front page of the Kansas City Star on Thursday, above the fold was a scathing article about my race, because we had not taken money from the money people in Washington, D.C. The reporter, thank you. you. You haven't met Jack Abramoff yet? He's a great guy. <laughs> I'm talking about the Democrats now. I ran two years ago with a party that quite honestly didn't have a clue what their message was. We spent $1.1 million in the second district and didn't get a message out because we had no message. And I learned that I don't care how much money you have. If you don't have a message, it doesn't matter. People sense authenticity. The man who interviewed my husband um, for this article in Washington, D.C., could not believe that I had not, in fact, gone to Washington to ask for money, that we, in fact, were running a campaign. It was a scathing article. What he didn't know was on Monday and Tuesday that we had, I'll face the audience, polling results that have us ahead, 43-41. When, let me just, when I went to the Manhattan Mercury for my interview today, he said, why do you think you're doing better? I said, because I have name recognition, because people are ready, but mainly because we are running such an incredibly different populist campaign back to the people 
that they sense authenticity. That's right. What I am hoping, when we win, we will make national news because this has been done so very differently. We will make national news, and I certainly hope that the Democrats in Washington understand that we've got to get our message back and get back to the people. So that there is wonderful. a one race. What one newspaper race. was this? Pardon? Was this the star, you say? On Thursday, yes. There is one race between the Republicans and the Democrats that are not working with the party, and that's in the second district of Kansas, and we will win probably because of that. Thank you. That's a great story. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, when I read your book, I found your your theory that that conservatism appeals, you know, appeals to to people in, in middle America, like you know, sort of middle income, lower income people, because it it kind of paints the source of their ills as as being the liberal elite. I found that insightful, but I, I I'm not entirely convinced that that they think that class has nothing to do with money. Do you think that you know perception of really high tax burdens or say really heavy, heavy environmental regulations on farmers, do you think that perceptions of that have a significant influence on, you know, on, on the thinking of conservatives in, in this part of the country? Like, do oh, you yeah, think of course, yeah. There's, uh, there's other, you know, many, many other factors. Um, the, the guy that, uh, that I'm sort of, the, the guy who thinks that money doesn't really uh, matter in class is David Brooks, and he's written about this many, many times. This is sort of part of his, his thesis. And this is something that is echoed all across the conservative movement. They, you know, they love him. Or, well, some of them love him. Some of them don't. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's, sure, there's plenty of, of, of reasons why people, of practical, everyday reasons why people hate liberals. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> you know, and there, there is plenty of, uh, I, I suppose, very good reasons for certain kinds of people to vote against liberals. But there are also plenty of people that... Um, I'm sorry, I'm just blabbing. I'm shutting up now. Anything else? <laughs> uh, yes. Where's that beer? <laughs> well, since you asked, I don't want to monopolize not the microphone, but I'm wondering, do you think there's, it's at all possible, you know, if the Democrats go back to the roots, for them to break through the wedge of abortion since it's become so strong now? Yeah, I think so. I think that, that a proper uh, populist economic campaign uh, would uh, just leave the culture war issues in the dust. Think about the 1920s. Okay, now this, uh, maybe that's a bad example, but in the, the 1920s, were like our own time, they fought these you know culture wars back and forth all the time. The issue wasn't abortion, but it was there was there was other ones. Um, uh, there was all sorts of, uh, of racial issues. There was prohibition. Uh, there was uh, uh, what are some of the other ones? Come on, you guys are historians. Uh, the 20s. It, the, anyhow, they fought the culture wars. What's, what's that? Yeah, the votes for women. They, they, but that wasn't really, a, that's sort of a different category. But they, anyhow, they fought the culture wars back and forth in the 1920s. And then the 30s came along, and that stuff just disappeared. I mean, you never heard of it, never heard of it again. You know, it was over. And that's uh, partially because, it, well, obviously the main factor there is the Great Depression. It just tends to blow that stuff away. But in a lot of places in Kansas, you have conditions very similar to that right now. I mean, it is hard times in a lot of working America. It seems to me that a proper Rooseveltian style message would just, you know, you, the culture wars would be over and forgotten. At least that's my hope. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Yes, sir. Um, it seems to me that the uh, stigma against the word liberal has taken on some pretty good momentum. Do you think it'd be easier to let that die off and start a new movement? And if so, what would it take for that movement to keep from being commodified and demonized? Well, uh, well the second question first. The, the, the problem with, the, with the, the liberals is that they have not been canny. One of the many, many, many problems with the liberals. They haven't been canny players. They don't, uh, I, I moved to Washington, D.C. recently. I meet a lot of Democrats there. Uh, they, don't even like to, they don't like to be called liberals. If you call them liberals, they're like, I'm not a liberal. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a Democrat. It's different. Uh, they, nobody wants to be called that. Um, I actually started calling myself a liberal just a few years ago, just because it's it's just such a things you know when when something is that hated, I, I, I'm drawn to it. <laughs> and, and, uh, so uh, uh, I I don't think you need a new word. I think you need to fight over this word, and they need to fight over all sorts of cultural terrain. See, she's got the right idea. She's going over to this microphone. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm also a Republican friend of the other girl, and I'm not from Kansas. I'm from St. Louis area, 
And I was wondering if you like you're stereotyping conservative America in general. And if not, what do you think of conservative America? Well, I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> I mean, I'm from conservative America. I came from a Republican family in a Republican neighborhood, went for Goldwater by 70%. My neighborhood did. Now, by the way, someone was saying that Mission Hills, this is where the liberals live. <laughs> and, and that's true, you know, by, in Kansas terms, that's true now. Um, but, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't really feel like I'm stereotyping anyone, obviously. Uh, you know, I wouldn't do it if I, if I was. I think that there is a lot, there are a lot of writers who do what you describe. Um, and they, you know, they fight back and forth. These, I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's this whole series of best-selling books uh, what's the latest one? It's called like Snafu or Foo Bars. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's tons of them that just make fun of conservatives. And that obviously wasn't my objective. I sat down and interviewed these people. Uh, and I talked to some of them for hours and more than once. And I also was, in my opinion, uh, I was more fair to them. I tried to be fair. Uh, and the, what I would compare it to is look at the way the Kansas City Star or the Wichita Eagle has treated these people. And those people, you go back and talk to the people that I interviewed in the book and ask them how they feel about, you know, the way the star or the Wichita Eagle treats them. Those papers don't give them the time of day. Don't even interview them. Don't even call them up when, they, when they're going to run something about them in the paper. At least I listened to their opinions and set them down at great length and tried to understand them. Uh, and no, I'm, I wasn't converted, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, my object wasn't to stereotype anybody. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, you talked a, lot, a couple times in your speech about, uh, you brought up the yo capitalism guy and you know, how he is kind of an economic conservative, but a Democrat. And you talked about how there really hasn't been a good Democratic president who's been economically liberal. Since Johnson. Um, since, since Johnson. I kind of like Carter, too, but... Carter was, you remember Carter was a, uh, was a conservative Democrat. I, I unfortunately don't remember Carter. Oh, He's oh, conservative. Oh. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, but that's okay. I, I was a Reagan baby. Uh, but he, but was, he, he, was, he ran against Muskie and, uh, and yeah. Humphrey. And he, the idea was he was the stop Wallace candidate. He would keep yeah. Wallace from screwing up the Democrat. Anyway, that's, that's, yeah. so, who cares? Uh, the point being, so, uh, like, at the nat national level, right, Kansas traditionally is a red state, right? So um, in the 2000 presidential election, I was Nader's campaign manager in southeast Kansas. And in Crawford, thanks. By the way, that's, 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 that's Eugene uh, Debs' country. That place yeah, used to be. Yeah, it is. Crawford County, which was a hot, socialist hotbed, we ran. Did you uh, all hear did, that? There was a place in Kansas that was a socialist hotbed. <laughs> Uh, we did a lot of, like, the history, you know, when we were trying to campaign, and 12% uh, of the county voted Nader. It was the third highest county voting Nader in the nation. Uh, Is that so? Yeah, yeah. Well, according to, according to info I got from the Nader campaign following yeah. his loss. Uh, and, uh, but what I, what I wanted to know is, um, I, I really feel like, well, Al Sharpton came here in 2000. Four, right? And I went to go hear him speak, and I was very disappointed because all he told me was to vote for Kerry because he is the best possible candidate. He came here the day after uh, Howard Dean made his big yell, and I was like, I totally lost respect for Al Sharpton. Uh, because he basically... You had respect for he him? Basically was like, <laughs> <laughs> he basically was like, you know, go for basically, you know, the best, you know, the, the best, worst yeah. of the, you know... The best of the losers, basically. Yeah. So I felt really let down. So do you see? Do you think third parties are a viable option, or do you ah, think we should so search? So we'll get to the for, question. Or do you think we should? Yeah. Or do you think we should search for real economic liberalism within the party? Well, look, the third parties have a long and uh, important history in America, but unfortunately, that history basically ends with populism. Uh, the populist movement, which I referred to earlier, which was so such a big deal in Kansas. Um, and all, uh, basically all over the Midwest and the South, what happened was after that, and it, it was following a tradition in third parties where a party comes up with an issue or with a, a handful of issues, and the major party, one of the two major parties embraces those issues or else dies, which is what happened with the Republican Party. The Whigs uh, died. But the populists came along, and the Democrats embraced, William Jennings Bryan, embraced a lot of their issues. 
But what happened was after that, after that episode, which really, you, you saw those pictures I was showing, that really scared a lot of people. I mean, they thought that Brian was like Robespierre or something. You know, this was going to be the French Revolution if he won. In fact, they, uh, the, well, that's, I won't go there. But William Allen White was one of those people that thought that he was just, you know, he couldn't believe it. And that's the famous essay, What's the Matter with Kansas? That's what it's about. Um, but uh, uh, after the populist episode, a lot of states, including this one, passed laws to make third parties uh, effectively uh, illegal. They, uh, they, what they did is they outlawed the main strategy that, that third parties use, which is called fusion, where they, they team up with one of the two major parties to get their issues out there. Uh, and that's illegal everywhere except for like New York and a couple of other states. And what this means is that you basically cannot have a third party in America until those laws are repealed. Uh, and so first of all, we've got to get those laws repealed. And, uh, and until that happens, no, I think you have to work within one of the two major parties. Or There's an outfit in New York you probably, I'm sure you know about, uh, called the uh, Working Families Party that tries to do, they have fusion there and they try to work with the Democratic Party. Or if you get a liberal Republican, they work with him or her yeah. and, and push the debate in their direction using this old 19th century tool. But by and large, that tool is forbidden to, to the rest of us. So I think you have to work within one of the two parties. Uh, I did want to recommend a book called The Company Owns the Tools, which is a great uh, okay. socialist children. It's a young adult novel. I think you'll really like it. <laughs> With your literary <laughs> interest. All right. Yeah. What did you say? Okay. Oh. Do you mind? Okay. Uh, I'm too short for this. But so I'm pretty much terrified at the idea of Sam Brown back running for president. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, hasn't he been a really fine senator here? <laughs> so I was kind of wondering what your feelings on that, his, about his probabilities of success and what that might mean for the country. Uh, well, that's really easy. I, I think he has very, not very good chances. I've, se I've seen Brownback speak. Come on, you guys have seen him. He's, yeah. uh, to be a, a politician on the national stage, you have to have certain skills, and he doesn't have them. Come on. He's, he just doesn't. He's, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but don't, I might be wrong. <laughs> you know, I what do I know? Not. By the way, a friend of mine, a friend of mine, wrote a very uh, excellent profile of Brownback in Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if, if you all have seen it, it it's, you it. really should check it out. The author's name is Jeff Charlotte, S H A R L E T, and it is it's amazing. He got uh, he got amazing access to Brownback. Sat around in his office for a week, went to his house in Topeka, uh, followed him around for weeks apparently, and it's it's an That's amazing, cool amazing story. Anyhow, yes, sir. No matter what party we are, how do we get, how far will the American people let government go before we become enslaved, basically, like the turn of the century? How far will we go before middle class demands change? I don't know. I ask that question all the time. I, 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 and I don't know what's, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because if the 19th century example holds, then we got a long way to go. Um, you know, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And uh, it, look, you don't want to ask me that. I'm a very depressing That's guy. That's too open you know, and yeah, I'm sorry. Wanna, I'm, I'm a very pessimistic guy. But there, at the same time, there, there are some good, you know, some good, good examples out there, people that want to that put a stop to this. But, uh, you know, we've talked about all the reasons why those people can't get elected tonight, and now we're going to go drink some beer. <laughs> I'm sorry to, uh, in questioning, but uh, Dr. Frank's going to be signing books back here, and we need to get started with that. Thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Frank.